Hey, one of my favorite stories, I've shared this story with you in the past many, several years ago, but it's one of my favorite stories about the difference between a young man who just kind of lets life happen to him. He's a downer, he's a pessimist, and a man who's an optimist, a young, young boy who is an optimist, and he is absolutely positive about everything. And they wanted to do an experiment on him. So some child psychologists arranged an experiment and they made two rooms. In one room was every kind of awesome new toy that you could imagine, all displayed, all there available. And the other room was a room that was filled with, what, filled with, well, horse manure. And they took the boy who was the pessimist, the one who was always a downer, who would just kind of let life happen to him, and they put him in the room with all the toys. And then they took the boy who was determined, the boy who was positive, the boy who was an optimist, and they put him in the room with the horse manure. And they just observed them for an hour. As they watched, the boy who was in the room with the toys just sat there, hands folded, legs folded, didn't play with any toys. They came to him and they said, Son, what's the deal? How come you didn't play with any of the toys? He said, well, I'm just afraid I'd probably break something or I'd find a toy that I like and I'd be disappointed because I couldn't take it with me. So I just decided the best thing to do is just sit here and not mess with them at all. They go to the other room and they see this boy. All they see him bent over and he's throwing horse manure everywhere. He's digging, he's throwing, it's going against the wall, it's going everywhere. And they stopped him and they said, young man, what in the world are you doing? He said, mister, with all this manure, there has to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> now that is what it looks like to be determined. And I want to talk to you about determination today and what we can learn from Jesus about determination. Um, a couple of very famous people that use determination to cause, to bring their success. One was Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison, as you know, invented the light bulb. Or at least he gets credit with that. Um, and he went through filament after filament after filament, hundreds and hundreds of experiments, trying to find a filament that would light and stay lit. And he failed over a thousand times. And they came to him and said, you finally succeeded. What did you feel about all those failures? And he said, I haven't failed. I just found a thousand things that don't work. <laughs> Howard Schultz was the CEO for Starbucks for many, many years. And he had the idea to start a coffee house and to make it a place of community. And he had a very clear image about what he wanted to create. And he said, I spoke to 242 people about investing, funding, many of those were banks, individuals, about funding my idea for this coffee house. And he said 217 of them said no. Can you imagine if you were one of the ones that said yes in that situation? That would be kind of interesting. But he, in other words, he was determined to succeed. Don't we want to be determined? Don't you think determination is an element in success? But when I say that, what do you have determination or what do you want to have determination about? Are you determined to be rich? Are you determined to be famous? Are you determined to accomplish your dream? What are you determined about? I believe what we're determined about says a lot about ourselves. And that's what I think we can learn from Jesus today. We learn about determination from him. Now this series is called Journey Through Golgotha. And the reason we've named it that is, do you understand that the cross is not the end? Now this is kind of a theological mind-blowing idea, but do you realize that if Jesus had died 
on the cross and stayed dead, he would have been the single greatest Passover lamb in the history of the Jews. But next year we'd need another one. But because he died and didn't stay dead, but the cross was just a checkpoint toward his ultimate determined uh, journey, his, his ultimate place where he was headed, the cross then becomes a checkpoint. And by the way, it can become a checkpoint for us as well. And we're going to talk about that as we move ahead. All right, so let me put it in context. So far, we've had two messages in this series. The first one I talked about at Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then he began to explain to his disciples, Peter, you are right. And that was revealed to you by my father in heaven. And he says, I am going to build my congregation, my followers on the proclamation, the understanding, the revelation of who I am and how that relates to you individually and personally. And so he began, he, he said that to them and then he explained to them. Now you understand that I have to go and suffer and die and raise from the dead. And you remember Peter rebuked him. Oh Lord, no, no, that's not cool. Wait a minute, you're going to be Messiah. You're going to be king. You're going to throw off the constraints, the, the bondage that we have under the Roman Empire, and you're going to establish your kingdom in Jerusalem, and we don't want to hear any more talk about you suffering and dying and raising from the dead. And Jesus rebuked Peter again and said, you are concerned with the things of humans, not the things of God. The next image that we saw, as Matt shared so well last week, was the transfiguration up on Mount Hermon, when Jesus, for just a moment, took down the veil that covered his glory, and they were able to see the brilliance of his glory, and I believe it was just a limited amount of his glory, or they probably wouldn't have been able to live, uh, that he had with the Father. And then the Father said, this is my son, listen to him. So the next thing I want you to see as we continue this journey is the determination of Jesus to accomplish everything the Father called him to do. We find that in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up. I want you to hear that again. When the days drew near for him to be taken up. Taken up, what does that mean? That means ascended. That means the crucifixion is done. The resurrection is done. His post-resurrection appearances are done. And he is ready to ascend back to the Father where he came from. Matter of fact, he prayed that the night before he was arrested. Father, return me to the glory I had with you before the world began. Father, I have accomplished your will. Now bring me back to yourself. And of course that happened. He ascended back into heaven. So listen, listen to what this says. He was looking forward to the days when he would be taken back up where he would go back. So think about it. that is through Golgotha and, and victory has happened. So when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now that is a very specific phrase that Luke used. In fact, Luke used those exact words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because he is parroting what was prophesied 700 years before by Isaiah. Isaiah verse 50, uh, chapter 50, verse 7 says, But the Lord helps me. Now, oh my goodness, you have no idea how I would love to open our Bibles to um, Isaiah chapter 50 
and walk verse by verse through this chapter. I want to encourage you to read it sometime this week. And it comes to the part where it's talking about the Lord's servant. The Lord's servant who becomes the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. Who took on our sins and suffered on our behalf. And by his stripes we are healed. He was bruised for our iniquity and for our sin. This is the suffering servant. In other words, this is a clear reference of God through Isaiah speaking directly to and about the Messiah. And it says this. But the Lord God helps me, the suffering servant, the Messiah. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. By the way, was Jesus ever put to shame? He went through one of the greatest shames that anyone can do. First of all, he was crucified as a non-Roman citizen, as a common criminal, because he was crucified on the cross. And that was only for those who were the outsiders. The Roman citizens had their head cut off, like Paul who is a Roman citizen. But an outsider, a nobody, a, a disposable human being, according to the Roman Empire, was crucified as a means of creating terror toward the rest of the population. Now, I don't mean to get graphic here, but I want you to understand what he suffered on the cross. Jesus hung on the cross completely naked. Can you imagine the Son of God with that humiliation? Was Jesus ashamed? Was he Put to shame? Yes. For a moment. For a time. And because he faced the cross, Paul tells us in Philippians 2 that he was ex given a name above every name. That because he faced the cross, he was exalted to the right hand of the Father. And he was given a name above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes, he suffered shame for a while, only to be glorified beyond any that's ever been. Because he was determined. He set his face like flint. You guys know what flint is, right? I, I don't want to give you the geological because I get it wrong. But, but you know, an arrowhead is made of flint. It, it can create a knife, a scalpel, that's sharper than metal can become. It is what was used, by the way, to do circumcisions. Was flint. Your face like flint, meaning immovable, absolutely determined, razor's edge focused. Do you get the idea? And that's how Jesus was determined to face the cross. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. But in the meantime, I want to tell you, last um, Thursday was a, was a date on the Jewish calendar. What was it? Her, yes. Pur. The word pur is the word lots, and purim is plural. So purim is the, the day where they celebrate the lots that were thrown by Haman to decide when all the Jews are going to be executed in the uh, Persian kingdom. So let's talk about that real quick. Just tell you this story. Um, king Ahasuerus was king of Persia, from 486 to 464 B.C. Um, 
He was extremely powerful. This was the world dominant power. You can see a map here of what they controlled. Matter of fact, the Romans didn't control a whole lot more than that. They, they went farther east toward, toward Spain. But um, that is a pretty huge area that the Persians were in control of. And this king, Ahasuerus, was one of the most powerful. He was probably the most powerful king in the world. And he decided to have a party. And this party went on for days. And the point of the party was to get drunk out of your mind. Just to absolutely enjoy yourself with drinking and eating and everything else that might go with a drunken party. And at one point, late in the, after several days, King Ahasuerus asked his queen, Vashti, to come and display herself before the drunken mob that was there. Now, whether it was to be just showing her beauty or whether there was more to that that got weird, I don't know. The point is that she refused to come. She said, I'm not going in there with those bunch of, bunch of drunken weirdos. I'm not doing that. And she stood her ground. And because of that, she was banished from the kingdom. But King Ahasuerus loved her. And he was bummed out that he, you know, afterwards, he said, ah, that was kind of harsh. I, okay, so the, his counselors got the idea, let's have a beauty contest. And they had a beauty contest, and Hadassah was chosen. Hadassah's Persian name was Esther. And so she is a Jewish girl young Jewish woman who had a cousin by the name of Mordecai who after her parents died when she was young had raised her. So he's older than her, but he's her guardian. Mordecai worked in the king's palace and he heard of a plot to assassinate the king. He gave the, the uh, king that information the plot was discovered, the bad guys were executed, and the king's life was saved. Along comes this guy by the name of Haman. We all did that very poorly. You know what the problem is? We don't have enough Jewish believers in here today. When you say Haman, you're supposed to boo. So Haman came along. Yes, yeah, you can do that. Uh, Haman came along, and he was an Agagite. You go... Gary, do I care? Yeah, yeah. King Agag was under, he was arrested instead of executed by Saul. Do you remember? And Samuel came and found out Saul didn't kill King Agag because God said, you kill everybody. And he didn't kill everybody. He kept the king. Samuel called him out on his disobedience. Samuel took a sword and killed King Agag. But the Agagites survived because Saul didn't do exactly what God said. And one of the descendants of King Agag was this guy, Haman. And he had a hatred of the Jews, of the Israelites. And he plotted to ask the king, he would pay the king lots of money to get rid of these troublemakers in his kingdom. Sound familiar? Let's kill all the Jews. And he cast lots to determine what day all of the Jews would die in the kingdom. And that's where Purim comes from. And they pick the date, and Mordecai finds out about it. In the meantime, Esther has been queen for a while in the, king, in the uh, uh, palace. And Mordecai comes to Esther and says, you need to take care, you need to do something about this to save our people. And here is the conversation between them. This is the key thing. And I want you to understand the determination in this story. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. So they're, they're not actually talking face to face. They're sending messengers back and forth. And Mordecai tells Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. I love that Mordecai understands. God has promised that through the seed of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, through his son Judah, 
will come the Messiah. So there is zero chance that the king and this kingdom are actually going to execute everybody so that God's plan fails. So God is going to bring deliverance one way or another. And then he throws down the gauntlet in front of her. And he says this, And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Why do you think you're queen? Do you think it's because you're just that beautiful? Do you not see the provident hand of God providing you with this opportunity for such a time as this? By the way, same thing with you. I love it when someone thinks they're a self-made person and they don't recognize that it is at God's discretion that men, people, are made great and given strength. You're not successful because you're all that. You're successful because the hand of God has allowed, has caused, has permitted you to be successful. By the way, you have not had some success at certain things because God has not allowed that to happen as well. And you can get all bent out of shape on that. I just believe that we need to understand that nothing happens apart from God's control. Oh, you can, you can disobey God. That's not what he wants. But even in your disobedience, God is going to ultimately use that to accomplish his purposes and his plan. Even your disobedience, to give you an idea, God used the disobedience, the hard-heartedness of Pharaoh to accomplish the exodus. So God will even use disobedience for his glory, ultimately. So he asks her, he throws the conflict down. Then Esther told them, the, the messengers, to reply to Mordecai. Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, nights or day. And I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king. Now notice that she prepared herself with prayer. She got herself spiritually in a place through prayer and fasting. And she said, then I will go into the king. And if I perish, I perish. Isn't that an incredible story? Well, she goes into the king. The, the, by the way, that's why that's a big deal. You go, wait a minute, it's his wife. Why didn't she just go talk to him? Well, there was a law. The laws in the Persian Empire were strange <laughs> to, to our mind as Americans. But... They could not be refuted. They could not be changed. And there was one law that said, if someone comes into the king's presence and he does not raise his scepter to allow them, they will be dead before they take another two steps. She could walk in and he could not notice her coming in. Do you follow? He would maybe have no desire to have her killed, but if he doesn't even notice her, she's dead before she has a chance. And the idea was protecting the king at all costs. You don't come to the king's presence without being called. And he hadn't called for her in a while. And so her walking in to see the king was incredibly bold, was amazingly courageous because she could have been dead before she took three steps toward the king. The king sees her and holds up the scepter, was glad to see her and said, what do you want? I'll give you anything up to half my kingdom. And she said, I want you and Haman to come to lunch. She prepared a banquet. They came to lunch. She gets there, and at the lunch, we could say she chickened out. I don't know exactly what was going on. What I know is she didn't tell the king that Haman has plotted to kill her and the other Jews. And she didn't ask. She didn't say it. She sa he said, well, what do you want? Again, I ask you. I'll give you anything you want up to half the kingdom. And she said... Um, I want you to come to lunch tomorrow again. Okay? Now, Mordecai would never bow down to Haman. And Haman hated him. Hated him so bad that he built a pole 75 feet tall that, he, that was sharp on the top 
that he was going to impale Mordecai on so that everyone could see what happens to Haman's enemies. And he left. He was awesomely proud because the queen invited him and the king only to lunch. And not only once, but twice. Wow, I am an insider, but I hate Mordecai so bad because he won't bow down to me. I'm going to build a 75-foot stake. Now, they call them gallows, but that's what we're talking about, a stake. Up in the air. All right, that night, the king couldn't sleep. What a coincidence. And he gets the, um, the, the records of the kingdom. And he reads about Mordecai thwarting this plot that was going to assassinate the king. And he said, whatever happened, what do we do for Mordecai? He said, well, nothing, king. It was in the midst of all that was going on and nothing. We didn't do anything for him. The next day, early in the morning, Haman gets up, comes to the king's palace, because he's going to ask the king if he can kill Mordecai that day. So Haman walks into the king. You can't make this up. This is such an incredible story. Haman walks into the king... And before he can request that he kill Mordecai, the king asks Haman a question. He says, Haman, what should the king do for someone he wants to greatly honor? Haman immediately thinks, the king is talking about me. Oh, yeah, I know, I know, king, what you should do. You should take one of your royal robes and put it on him and take one of your royal horses and parade him through the streets with someone announcing... This is what the king does for the one he wants to greatly honor. The king says, great idea. Do that for Mordecai. <laughs> he was so mad. And he goes out. Can you imagine him? Puts it, Mordecai sitting up on the horse. Haman is leading the horse through the street saying, this is what the king does for one he wants to greatly honor. <laughs> This is what the king does for one he wants to greatly honor. You can imagine, I mean, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm, can you imagine, in his voice? Well, that afternoon he goes, well, the good thing is at least I'm going to lunch with the king in, in the presence of the queen again. They get there. They have a nice lunch. The king asks again, what do you want, Esther? And she said, I want my life. I wouldn't even ask except... It's the life of my people. Who threatened you? Haman. The king is angry with Haman. What do you mean? He made a law to kill me and all of our people. Who would dare threaten the queen of Persia? And the king is angry and he walks out of the room to get his head about him. While he does that, Haman realizes, I am a dead dog. And he falls actually onto Esther, like on her lap or on her, she's sitting on the couch and he falls down where he's actually got his head in her lap or on her touching her. When the king walks back in and says, what are you going to rape her now? Now he didn't say those words exactly, but that's the in inference of what he's talking about. Go kill Haman. And they say, oh, by the way, king, he set up a pole 75 feet high to kill Mordecai, the man who saved your life. You can tell that the servants loved Mordecai and could not stand Haman. And the Agagite Haman gets hung, actually impaled on that with all of his sons, by the way. And his family tree is wiped out. Now they still have a problem. That date for Purim is still coming up. And so the king gives Mordecai and Esther the opportunity to rewrite a law where the Jews can defend themselves. And they defend themselves with great honor, with great ferocity, and the devastation of the Jewish people in Persia is uh, prevented. What a great story. What a story of determination. Do you understand that that determination required a point of decision? where they would not any longer stay still, but would take the next step. Now with that in mind, think of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen to him. 
Now think about this. There, he's giving incredible detail here. He says this. Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip, and crucified. Amazing detail. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. What an amazing story of determination. I, am, I have set my face like flint to be arrested, mocked, flogged, crucified, because on the third day I will raise from the dead. I'm doing what my Father has asked me to do. John 5.30, Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. In John 17, 4, Jesus is praying to the Father right before he goes to Gethsemane and is arrested, tried, next day crucified, and buried in the ground. And right before that, he said to the Father, I have brought you glory on earth, listen, by completing the work you gave me to do. Are you completing the work God gave you to do? That's why we ask that question today. Many of you had a great answer. Are you completing the work God called you to do? Are you completing the work you've decided you want to do for yourself? What are you determined to do? Are you determined to complete the work God gave you to do? Are you determined to complete the work you have thought up for yourself so that you can have fill in the blank? Money? Prestige? Influence? Success? Happiness? What are you determined to do? Notice the difference between Jesus' determination and the determination that is lauded in the world. It's significantly different. Jesus said, I am going to finish the work. Let me talk about Paul for a second. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. He says, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. In Philippians 3, Paul says again, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. I haven't accomplished all the work yet. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past. Wow, how important that is. And looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. You can accumulate success in this world, the treasures of this world, or you can accumulate the success that God defines, the success that will provide rewards in heaven. Paul says, I, I am going for it. I am determined to get there. I want to complete everything God has called me to do. In 2 Timothy, at the end of his life, he says this, so, so think about these other verses. I could give you many other examples of Paul where he said, I'm working toward it, I'm working toward it, I'm finishing the work, I'm finishing the work. I haven't yet finished the work. I forget the past. I go on to finish the work. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he says this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. A drink offering, you took a glass of wine and you poured it out before the Lord. We would say wasted it the way the lady worst wasted thousands of dollars worth of perfume on Jesus' feet you catching this can you waste anything you do for the lord pour it out and that's what paul is this is exactly the image he's saying i'm poured out like a drink offering i am wasting my life in service to the lord what are you wasting your life in service to? Let me give you a word of waste here a minute ago. I have never been very svelte. <laughs> I wore husky jeans when I was a kid. 
That's a harsh name to call them. In other words, I would have bought in the big people's shop. And that's just been the way it is. I've just never been skinny. You can say, well, it's just you or, you know, you eat too much. Yeah, I eat too much. That's true. I, by the way, I'm around people that are super skinny that eat twice that I do, and I hate them. Not, not actually. You know, I'm kidding. But uh, I've always been. So I was raised where, you know, the poor children in China, I was told. Now, can you believe that, China? The world's changed, right? But when I was a kid, the people in China are starving. You need to eat all your food. So I never wasted any food on my plate. And then one day, as I was trying to lose weight, I realized I can waste that food in my belly or in the trash. Which of the two is healthier? And so I began to quit being quite so crazy about wasting food by throwing it in the trash. Because I can waste it when I put it in my mouth, too. Do you, do you all understand what I'm saying? You're still wasting it once you've eaten more than you ought to eat. You're wasting it, except it's bad for you. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it sure does to me. So I don't waste enough food. Let me say that. You can look at me and tell, hey, Gary's wasting more food right now because he's losing weight. You could say that. I know that's silly. The point is... It, you're wasting your life. Are you wasting your life for the Lord? Or are you wasting your life for yourself? I use that word waste in quotes. So what? So how determined are you to fully do the Father's will? How many times does your personal will overrule his will? What would the Lord have you surrender to him today? The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Paul's a good example we use today. Esther and Mordecai are great examples we use today. Paul is a great example that we use today. One of those witnesses who lived a life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance, with determination, the race God set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. What if we took some of that determination? Some of you are incredibly determined. We took some of that determination and we began to be determined to fully finish the work God has put before us. Father, give us that determination Lord, help us to learn the determination that Jesus had. That we might, like Paul, like Mordecai, like Esther, like our Savior, be determined not to bring success and honor and glory and money and so on to ourselves through our determination, but that we might be determined to fully finish all the work you have called us to do. Lord, give us that encouragement, give us that determination, give us that motivation, Father, to surrender fully to your will, determined to do all that you've called us to do. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I love you guys. Have a really great week. Get your reservations in for the Passover Seder.